Welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series, your resource for the latest news and updates on pressing issues facing the accounting profession. Good afternoon and welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series. I'm Eric Auskerson, one of your hosts for today. And as usual, we've got a very full program. We're going to start it off with a broad 2021 outlook. And then we're going to get into the latest uh, with the legislative activities in D.C., talk a little bit about the final stretch we're in for PPP, and then talk about some of these other business relief programs, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund and Shuttered Venue Grant. And we always close with our open forum. You can earn CPE by responding to 75% of the pop-ups. You've got that toolbar where you can download today's materials. And if your, browser, if your video freezes, please refresh your browser. So with me today are Barry Melanson, who you all know, uh, the leader of the AICPA. We also have Stephanie O'Rourke, uh, a partner at Cone Resnick, and she's been leading their PPP and business relief activities, and she's going to be talking about the RRF program uh, today. And you all know Lisa Simpson, who leads the firm services section. So with that, I'd like to uh, bring Barry up. Uh, another busy week, uh, Barry, as usual, and we're We've been talking to a lot of business leaders, and that's going to that's gonna kick off our discussion about uh, the 2021 outlook. And to prep that discussion, we're highlighting here a couple of articles, an article uh, highlighting uh, J.P. Morgan Chase's outlook, Goldman Sachs's prediction, and some really good news related to the vaccines. And there, this, is the, this is all summarized on this slide. And it starts with the pandemic and the great progress that we're making uh, around the vaccination. 50% of the U.S. adult population now have one shot, over 130 million adults in America. Very, very impressive. And we always said, you, you know, you had to take care of the health issue before you got the economy going. And now you look at this. You've got some, some forecasters stating that 2021, we could have 8% growth. The last time the U.S. economy grew at 8%, was in 1951. And the, the feeling is this is going to last a couple of years. So we'll talk a little bit about that. With that, why is that all happening? Because demand is going up and that demand is driving supply chain challenges. I think we're all hearing about that uh, with our small business clients. You're, you're feeling it as a, as a consumer. Uh, and then the, probably the, the biggest thing that we're, we're all thinking about uh, here in the profession with the trusted advisors are these business model changes. We've been talking about it for the past year, uh, but what has happened here is the pandemic has truly propelled us forward a number of years with technology, technology adoption, but it's also changing ways of, of, of working fundamentally in businesses. So Barry, I mean, you're talking to these business leaders, you're talking to the firms, um, and this has been moving fast because if you and I were having this discussion in January, we would not have these levels of predictions right now. No, we wouldn't. And of course, they are predictions. So we don't know, you know, for sure. But I think it's a point of view that's very important for all of our members on this program to take into consideration. You, you know, the first thing I think about when I hear this is very early on when we started the town hall series, we had a series of slides of what's our focus. And it was about consumer confidence and it was about small firms and about that trusted environment that we can bring as a, a small businesses when I said and uh, the trusted environment. And I, I think maybe the most important message out of here is it's easy for CPAs to be conservative. I mean, that's a mantra that we go with to a large degree. But when we talked about that a year ago or so, we, we talked about it was very important that we were a voice for business leaders and obviously our individual clients that, um, that, that you know, there is, you got to be looking down at the light at the end of the tunnel. There are opportunities here. And however you want to put your sort of own take on this, it's really, really important, I think, for our profession to be part of that mental rejuvenation and seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And that's a really important strategic thing that I think will make a big difference with the relationship with clients or your employer. It's not just you can't. There is these you can opportunities that are out here. And, and it's strong. I mean, it clearly there will be people among us who say, you know, government spending is too much and it's going to be a drain and all of those things. But the fact is, is that while there are probably areas of bubbles in the market or in the economy as a whole, 
Um, there are obviously lots of opportunities and, and, you know, the American entrepreneurial spirit somewhat rises over every challenge. And these people who are predicting that I think are, are, are focused on it. Yeah. yeah. And, and what's going to happen is this becomes more of a reality. Everyone's waiting to see what Q1 of 2021 will be. Uh, it's, it's in this range, you know, six and a half to 10 percent. And you get that data point. And that's going to affect, we're going to move into the policymaker dis, uh, discussions, but that's going to start uh, affecting what policymakers do related to the next phase of economic stimulus. But there's a lot of discussions on how positive the economics, what the, the role of the economic stimulus played in 2020. And there's still a lot of good, good positive discussions around what it means in, in 2021. And I think you got to take the politics out of it. There's so much emotion in the polarization of politics and say, okay, the spending has been done or that's been approved. Yeah, we got some potential more legislation. So it, it is what it is. And I think, you know, our members in business and industry know about scenario planning really, really, really well. And I think as it relates to a firm dealing with the client, it's like, what if this is right? What if it's not? Now, there are some challenges on here. One is supply chain challenges. I think that disproportionately affects small business. It does affect biz big business potentially too, but small business is a player in a, in a supply chain. They're not generally the lead in a supply chain. And if we go back to our university studies and we talked about marketing and, you know, the, 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 the sort of strategies of marketing and of course supply, who's the, who's the lead in a supply chain is a very important notion. And so there's risk points there that I think we've been talking about for over a year in the supply chain. There's clearly things that people are seeing as is really difficult to get um, their hands around. Lumber is probably on the top of the list or certainly near the top of the list. But that last point, too, Eric, is really important. We've seen we've seen we've all lived it. We've seen business model changes very dramatically in businesses that we deal with or clients or work for. I guess I would have a subtext on here that we are also seeing it in firms. And we are in the midst of a major change of business models uh, in firms, rethinking of business models, everything from pricing and structure, um, obviously mergers and acquisition, investment in technology, moving to technology with clients, client acceptance. And something that's been talked about a lot in these town halls is you have to think about the opportunity strategically and what fits your firm. And when it doesn't, maybe you partner in a different way. And that's a business model change as well. Well, Barry, we're going to have an economist in a future town hall just in, in, this spring to further kind of unpack where all this is going. But let's let's us move on and talk a little bit about what's going on in D.C., uh, the two point three trillion dollar infrastructure tax plus bill and and a smaller bill, uh, this this PPP Schedule C retroactivity. Bill. Yeah. So so in, in pulling all this stuff together, Eric, good job on putting the comma tax plus plan there. That's that's not how the media would refer to it, obviously. Uh, but um, or maybe the administration. The, the, clearly, there is just tremendous moving parts there. And, and so I guess a couple of things that I would think about. First off, yes, you have to be aware of it. You have to be talking about it with clients, but don't expect certainty. It could move quickly, but until it actually moves and becomes law, there's going to be a degree of uncertainty. And let's also remember that um, the, the margins in the House and the Senate are extremely small. Even in the House, um, while the Democrats you know, uh, control the House, Speaker Pelosi has a very, very small percentage on some days because vi vacancies occur when you have 435 member House. It, you know, in, in some days in the last couple of weeks, it was three. And so those are very narrow margins. And when you talk about tax and infrastructure and winners and losers and those things, it's very hard to keep a small majority like that together. And, you know, in the Senate, we know it's 50-50 and um, it seems to be some of this is going to go through on reconciliation, which, which allows for a 50 percent vote. I'd say it this way. Anybody on television or whatever tells you they know exactly what's going to be in this bill. I would put a big question mark behind it. It has just got a lot of moving parts. It's going to have a lot of implications from tax planning uh, to, you know, just business viability and things of that nature. And so uh, you, you really have to pay attention, but, but it is about paying attention and thinking it through. On the PPP issue, uh, you know, we have, been, um, we have been all over this issue. This is an example of, you know, here President Biden made a, 
a speech about changing the way uh, schedule seers could calculate PPP using the gross method. And it's a, it's a prime example of a big giant government, you know, sort of what is said and what gets executed, not necessarily being aligned. And the retroactivity has been very emotional for our members, for their clients about this, it seems unfair. And so um, there is legislation focused on this. It, you know, it's possible it will pass. I wouldn't say it's probable. Um, and even if it does, the question becomes, is there going to be sufficient funding? So it's possible it passes with, with some small amount of targeted funding in this area. It's possible, but not necessarily probable. We will keep you up to date on it. Um, there is an inequity there that early filers clearly have been treated differently. So that, that is sort of some, some of the overview points um, in, in that space. Yeah, so just, just a couple more comments on, on this slide, and sometimes we're going on and off the slides here, uh, just a little bit more video. But regarding the retroactivity, you know, one thing that we're all watching around PPP is you have the May 31st date, and then you have when the funding runs out. So if the funding runs out the day, Barry, they pass the retroactivity bill, <laughs> it, it won't matter. So that in, But what they still could do is all of a sudden, this bill popped on Monday or, Monday or Tuesday night, uh, they could just they could add they could add some special funding. So we'll we'll be watching that. And I think on the the, the big two point three trillion dollar bill, it, we got to see what happens with with the economy over the next over the next sixty days. That's you cannot ignore what's going to be happening with the economy. I agree. It's just that that ripple effect. And we have you know we have members that are working through our tax area in all of these potential areas, providing the unintended consequences types of things that we do very well when people are debating different tax provisions and the technical implication, we, you know, they don't always listen to that, but we provide a very important role in that. And, you know, congressional oversight is another part of the phase that we're going to go into in all of this. There will be second guessing. Um, this is not a perfect program. There will have been fraud in it. Uh, all of these programs are not perfect, I should say. Um, and, and there will be fraud and, and there will be second guessing and there will be some media stories. We've known this all along. We've been talking about it all along. And, um, it, you know, there will be focal points that'll come out into this. And we have been communicating, uh, about concerns. And if, in fact, Eric, the, the, the team here where we've, you know, obviously been part of a process to make it available has done a great job of putting controls in place to minimize that as it relates to the portfolio that's come through the profession, but um, it's, it's not going to be zero. We know it's not going to be zero. Yes, absolutely. So let's, let's move on to, to the, to the next slide here and, and we'll, we'll come back to PPP, uh, but let's, we have a huge effort here by the town hall community, as you well know, Barry, huge effort by the AICPA and many others. So why don't you reflect a little bit on, on the tax deadline? And then I know we're going to talk a little bit about, a, you know, thoughts 60 days out, you know, you know, kind of, you know, working through the, the final final days of tax season. Yeah. So let's first just start off with it. it it's tough, right? It's tough right now, even though we pass April 15th in normal years, firms would be in a little bit of a, a catch your breath period of time right now. And, and, and for the most part, that's not here. Yes, we were very vocal on trying to get the estimated tax issue fixed. Uh, it didn't. Um, I think the overarching issue that is that is in play here is that service levels are critically important for the IRS to be focused on. They've testified that a lot of these service areas have been fixed. I can tell you the feedback we get from members don't necessarily support that. Um, so I think the next 60 days that will play out to a large degree. Um, and but it's but it's just absolutely essential to our effective tax system, which is a voluntary compliance system for these overlaps, mail crossing or mail not being answered, you know, phones not being answered, all of these service levels. And we've been very, very vocal. We've got great bipartisan support, on, even on the issue of the extension. Not much is bipartisan now. In fact, this was a this was signed. It, where, where there are things that are bipartisan, it, always does, it doesn't always manifest as actually people signing letters, uh, members of Congress signing letters. We had 60 plus bipartisan signatures. Um, and I think Congress understands that this resonates to, you know, small business, individuals, et cetera. And we continue to make these points. I think now we're in this phase of, you know, the IRS service level has to be there. And, and let me just say, look, the IRS is made up of a lot of men and women who are trying really, really hard, have the best intent to do the right thing. Just like 
people in firms and just like people in businesses is just people trying to do the right thing. But there are things there that need to be fixed. And we're, we are consistently delivering that message. So one of the silver linings may have been just all the attention that the IRS got uh, by all of these, you know, leaders, policy makers, and hopefully that's going to that's going to help advance some of the issues around service levels. So, Barry, you're, you know, Carl Peterson has the Carl Peterson corner. You've heard that's a popular one. That's great. Uh, just like you're popular as you as you give the, you know, provide the vision and the strategy for the profession. But as you look out here, I mean, this is it's April 22nd. It's not April. It's not like a normal April uh, uh, due to the fact that we've got May 17th and we got business relief and You've got, you know, you look at the list here, you've got, you got a travel considerations, you know, business considerations. So how are, how are you reflecting on this as you talk to the, to the firms? You know, I, I think, first off, I think a lot of people see tremendous opportunity and their clients are facing and their firms actually are facing a lot of these different challenges. Um, for instance, vaccinations and what clients want if you're doing audits, for instance, remote auditing. Um, travel considerations. I, I, there's a there's a feeling I think a lot of people have that there's this pent up notion, right? You know, vaccines. And look, let's face it, from a U.S. perspective, the vaccine distribution has been best better than essentially most places in the world. There's a few smaller countries that have done better. Um, there are there are major cities that still have issues in this country, and there are major cities around the globe that have issues. But the fact is, is there's this pent up uh, I'm almost going to say boredom that's in society as a whole, that's ready to go. And, and that's actually part of those growth projections that you described earlier, Eric, that there's, you know, we know people are going to travel. We know people are going to vacation and that's going to have a lot of effect. Um, I think, you, you know, I think it's important again in your trusted advisor role to have these conversations with clients and yourself as far as running a firm uh, about what expectations are real um, you know, the, the tax deadline issue is 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 going to continue to be in different stages of, of, you know, obviously things have been extended or they'll be extended in May 17th. So the complexities are still there. Again, back to your economic growth point from from Goldman and uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, et cetera. They they you know, they're pretty bullish. And um, I I'd come back to we play this role of being conversant in all of these areas we can be the voice that helps clients really think about those. They're so busy, just like we are. And to step out of that and really play that true business advisor role, I, I just think the opportunities for that, we've been talking about it for decades in the profession, ha has never, never been uh, great, you know, greater than it is. And frankly, you know, a year ago in March, March 27th, Eric, you and I yeah. did, a, did a video about some of these programs. And, and it, it was probably a 20 minute video. It went out to the whole profession. And if you took one theme from it, it was realize what the intent is. And the intent was to get things back to work. And I think it's what are the intent of these types of activities? I'll close with this on this point. The wellness of the profession, we, we have to take care of ourselves and our people, just like every other business or every other profession or every other segment of society. There are, there are, spots there. You know, people have burned out. It's been going on for a long time. Their business model changes that are stressful, as we just talked about. And I think as leaders, I don't care if you're a sole proprietor with one employee or if you're just so sole proprietor worrying about yourself. It's it it is important that this is part of what people think about. There's just so much going on in the world that it's important for us to deal with that as humans, as humans, and our profession has been tremendously successful. We've delivered on huge promises as a, as a profession. And you'll have a slide in a moment that shows that, Eric. And, but we have to also be careful because we can't deliver on those promises if we don't also take care of ourselves. Well, I think that's, this is a, that was a great conclusion, Barry, just as this opening uh, section. I've, I've seen a lot of good comments just on looking at the outlook, stepping back, you know, we're looking at multiple forests here on what's, what's happening, but ending with that wellness points. Now we're going to stay with me. We're going to bring a dive a little bit back into, uh, into PPP, what you see. I mean, this is, this, you just mentioned, you know, March 27th, when we talked about the cares act last year, this has been historic $750 billion total. If you add this 240 plus the, the original 500 billion plus 
it, it looks like we're probably going to hit 5 million loans in this second phase here. So 10 million loans total. It's about 7 million uh, businesses that have gotten a loan. There's, there's, there's a 3 million that have gotten a second draw. So Barry, I mean, you, 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 you just commented on, I don't know if there's anything else about kind of well, what this well, here's is what, here. help drive the, the, that, that, that eight, this is helping drive the five day percent growth. It, what, what, it's, what it's a huge factor. Go back to the intent. It was to provide employment, to keep people employed. And, and the way forgiveness occurred, the bulk of that had to be spent on payroll. And it, it has fueled the economy to a large degree. It's a big chunk of money and it has fueled the economy. The small business community, the small business economy. And that has these huge economic ripple effects that we all studied when we were in university and it's playing out. The other thing that I would say is, um, if, even if you are a golfer, you probably haven't been playing golf recently. I know that's the case for, for most golfers today in this world. But, um, you know, they say about golf, golf is not a game of perfect. These programs are not programs of perfect. Um, and we also said that on March 27th. This is a massive things. You know, it's it's the size of what we talked about in 2008, just this one program. But it's 10 million interactions. It's not a few hundred banking interactions. It's just, the magnitude is totally different. And, you know, again, there's going to be things that are not going to play out right. I'll come back to the demeanor of the profession again. We have, I just think we have this huge opportunity to be the, the rational voice when a, when a client is upset or frustrated or the rules don't make sense, like the Schedule C retroactive point you know, explaining context and be the deliverer of that message is a huge value proposition for our profession. That's what it means to be a professional and to be able to articulate those things and to, and to deliver messages along those lines without letting them spin out of control. It's not perfect. What the government did was not perfect. We could all second guess pieces of it. Guess what? All of us are not perfect. And so I just think that's a really important message to keep in your sort of your memory banks when you're dealing with people. Yeah. I mean, you can say, I mean, the vaccines are out there and working and, and the economy is, 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 is moving forward. So we'll get a couple of final, as we look at this final stretch activities here, uh, lenders are working on the resolution of error codes. There's still, there's still a lot of, a lot of error codes out there, probably in the thousands, the SBA is giving more capabilities there. There's even local SBA offices that are offering support. One thing that the SBA has told us, there are some applications that are going to get denied in the end. And, and what we really want to try to work with the SBA on is we got to get that message out. So, you know, and this is not easy news to deliver. So it's back to many of the points that Barry made, just how we manage that. What's the focus right now? There's a lot of focus on draw twos for people that got to draw one in 2021. You've got to, you've got to, you know, most lenders are making you wait for your eight week covered period end before you can get that second application in. Every day I hear about firms finding Schedule C clients that just weren't fully aware of PPP. And then we've already talked about this the money running out. It's, it's something you just got to watch daily right now, end of April, early May. But things could slow down. It could, it could last, it could last a little longer. And then a lot of lenders are, are closing their platforms as they see this coming to an end, because everyone's trying to figure out how do you, how do you wind this down properly with your client base? And that's one thing with the firms we've been talking about Barry is, is making sure if you've got a client that's been trying that you're just having that, that open, open discussion with them. If they've got an error code, there's only so much you can do. And, and, and that's, that's, that's kind of the state that we're in right now. That's right. And it's speaking to them and understanding it and, and helping them, if it's possible to be fixed, et cetera. Eric, I, I'd close on this before we get into some of the detail. One last thought. I think um, I, I, I hope everyone who's on here is proud of the profession and what it's done in this process. I know I am. I know everyone here, the ICPA, the board, everybody is proud of it. And, and you know, we talked again back to a year ago, we talked about our profession over the next coming. We didn't know how long it was going to last and how many programs it were going to be. We're going to be the equivalent of the medical profession for the, the business community, particularly the small business community. We've delivered on that as a profession. Each and every one of you who have been on these town halls, you should feel extraordinarily proud of that. Mm -hmm. And and I think as we get into sort of this second year, um, look, take some of these materials and speak about it at a 
you know, at a business league when it, you can have lunch meetings again in your town or if you're on the local chamber board, take 10 minutes, get 10 minutes of agenda and airtime, explain the magnitude of this and, 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 I, and, you know, communicate as well about the role the profession has played. Uh, I think we deserve to, to reinforce that in the business community. Collectively, it is just an incredible story. That's great. Great, great close there. And, and let's bring Lisa up and we're going to talk about forgiveness. And Barry, I think it's something it's so important to talk, tell that story that you just mentioned for the, your local community. And just we made payroll. I mean, I, I, we were on a call with a, a past Treasury official a, a week ago and he said he said to us, he goes, do you realize seven million people were being laid off every week? He says there is no way the unemployment offices in America could have processed them. So what they did was they did this program with the firms, with the lenders, because it would have brought those systems to a crawl. And then so we put these we put these other arteries in place. So I think it is good. I think it's good to reflect in and, and people want, you know, people are going to want to hear the story about how all these vaccines got made in one year time when they said it was going to take three years. So Lisa, we can go, we can, we're probably running, we can go on and on here. But Barry, <laughs> if, with this last slide, you might want to even have a comment on this. We've got forgiveness. Let's bring the forgiveness slide up. And Lisa, I know this is something that you get questions every day on uh, it is related to where are we at? And we're at above 50%. Yeah, and that's great news. We're hearing that the SBA is approving 97% of their forgiveness applications within a week. That's what they're reporting. Uh, if we talk to lenders and if I look through the Q&A from the town hall, it seems like a different story. Um, so we've got hundreds of questions about what's going on with forgiveness really quickly. Um, it is beginning to pick up, but it's still going slow. We've gotten some success stories from the lenders we've been talking with, but there was a, a $2 million loan that had been at the SBA since July that just got noticed that had been forgiven. We're hearing a few more stories like that, some $600,000 loans, $285,000 loan came through the Q&A thanking us for our forgiveness spreadsheet. So there is some movement but it's still not happening within that 90 day window that the, um, that the SBA had promised. The flip side of that is the lenders are beginning to start working on forgiveness. So they're sending out notices to their borrowers saying, you know, hey, you've got a covered period of 24 weeks after um, the beginning of when the loan was made. We're getting close to that 10 month deferral period after 24 weeks. So just start thinking about that. And on the call today, we explained you might not get a lot of applications yet because borrowers are still trying to navigate employee retention credit and PPP forgiveness. So, it, you know, it's, it's slow going. If you're getting notices from your lender, they're just trying to put it on your radar and they want you to know when your deferral period is up. So it's not a mandate that you apply um, for forgiveness at all, but they just want that on your radar. So getting a lot of questions about that in the Q&A. So I thought I'd go ahead and throw that out there. Well, that's, that, Barry, that's going to drive deadlines. The deadline will be when your, your first uh, payment is due, and that's going to drive behavior. And the at lenders, I'll tell you, the lenders want, they're going to be motivated. The SBA has been holding it up a little bit. The SBA wants to get it off, uh, off the businesses you know, books, uh, get these forgiven. It's a grant. We always said this was a PVP is a grant program. Just follow the rules and it's a grant. So let's, uh, let's hope that, that, that this will be a big summer activity. It will be. And it's important to, to, to know that I think the government wants it wrapped up as well. So I think, uh, I think there's an, there's going to be sort of a greater, uh, urgency that's going to come from that side. Um, as we move on to different types of programs and different issues in society. Well, Barry, we'll bring back for, I'm sorry, go ahead, Lisa. I was just going to say, I've talked in the past about the comments the SBA has made around trying to simplify that process for loans between 150000 and $2 million. That is still on their radar, um, but it's it's got to go through their processes. So we'll keep you posted on that and, and continue to ask what kind of progress is being made around that simplification conversation. So Barry, thanks for those reflections. We'll bring you back for open forum. We'll keep going. So Lisa, we got you got a few things to cover here. Yeah, before we dive into business relief, I want to um, give you a couple of quick tax topics. About a week ago, I guess, since it's the 22nd, we started hearing buzz around 
um, CPAs whose clients had submitted um, electronic funds requests to have their estimated payments withdrawn from their accounts. Something happened, the um, payments didn't get withdrawn. And so obviously that's cause for concern. We've reached out to the IRS and they have acknowledged that it was a glitch in their system as yet an undefined glitch, but they say that it has been resolved. So a couple of key things. The IRS is saying, do not take any additional action. Make sure you've still got the funds in the account, but um, don't take any additional action at this point in time. We're expecting that they'll make an official announcement very soon. So I know that there's been um, some questions in that about the, er, in the Q&A about that. So just wanted to let you know, it's not just your client, it's not your tax processing software. It was a glitch at the IRS. Another quick um, tax question that we're getting is around, have we gotten any information from uh, the IRS clarifying how to record PPP loans in, in um, the standpoint of basis? And the answer is no, we still do not have that guidance. You will hear us, um, tweeting and posting on LinkedIn and writing JVA stories about it as soon as we get any information, but not yet. So a couple of big tax topics on our agenda. Well, thanks. And that brings us right back into business relief here. Business relief. So I'm, I'm kind of keeping this just as, as a refresher for you so that you can see the holistic approach to business relief options at the federal level. And we'll talk about um, PPP a little bit. We're going to dig into the Restaurant Revitalization Fund today. We've got a, a great guest joining us on that topic. Quick hit on SVOG. Um, but the point around this slide is there's a lot, and you really have to be thinking about your strategy and communicating to your clients about the different uh, program offerings, but also deciding which ones you want to devote your time and attention to and which ones you need to refer out. So if you've got a client, uh, if you've got a handful of clients that are in the shuttered venue category, that may not be somewhere where you wanna devote your time getting up to speed on all the ins and outs. So find someone that you trust in your referral network to handle those clients for you. That frees you up to work on some of these other programs that might be more prevalent or more relevant for your client base. So um, on ERC, just a quick note, lots of questions about are we getting any additional guidance there? Did we get answers to our questions about um, shareholder wages being eligible and spouse wages being eligible? Still advocating for that guidance. And we're working on a um, kind of a practical, get your hands dirty approach to filing for ERC. So we've got that webcast in the works and we'll let you know about that in the next Town Hall newsletter. Um, so speaking of complexity, here's the, the, the chart that the SBA has put together. You've got a link to it. Um, as an aside, if you're new to the town hall, it's incredibly important for you to download the slides that are in your materials. Those will get you access to all of the resources that we're going to point you to today so that you always know where to go get the most recent information. So again, it's, it's getting to be an eye chart. We're, we're getting used to these eye charts, but this one's a pretty good summary as you're talking with your clients or put this on your website or put it in a newsletter so that you're making them aware of the programs and the interplay between the, all of the offerings. Yeah, a lot of nuances. We'll talk a little bit about that maybe even in open forum. A lot of nuances. Um, really quickly, just a reminder about the resources that we have around PPP. So on this and the next um, next slide, you'll see some of the resources that'll dig into the questions that you have around PPP. I'm highlighted on um, a slide that in purple, we've updated the um, calculating the revenue decline. So that's one of the common questions that we've been getting. And on the next slide, um, we'll take a look at the answer. And unfortunately, I don't think it's an answer most people are going to want. Um, but the question has been since the launch of the second draw, are um, other grant funds, other CARES related funds included in gross receipts when calculating your 25% revenue decline? I was able to get an answer from the SBA and the answer is unless it's PPP or idle, it is included in your revenue calculation. We asked a deeper question about what about not-for-profits and restricted contributions? 
And the answer we got back was go read internal revenue section 6033 um, of the code. And basically that's an answer that says, yes, restricted contributions are included in gross receipts, even though we fully acknowledge that that doesn't make sense because you can't use those to make payroll or pay rent that they are restricted. So unfortunately we have an answer um, so we've got some closure around it, but it may not be the best answer for our borrowers. Uh, we have a new resource that I wanted to call your attention to. If you remember back to our previous town halls, we've highlighted that there are four um, accounting models that you can use for accounting for PPP. And um, we've got a link to the, the list of the four of those. We've been building out our resources and this week I've got a great video with Carrie Hipsack, who you all know, and Chris Cole, who leads our NFP section, talking about one of the um, models, the conditional contribution model. So you've got a great video there, which will give you some sample disclosures, the journal entries, and um, some good information. We've also got a link to the video that we released last month around um, using the debt model. So good, good accounting um, resources there for you. Next up, we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, and I am excited to bring in Stephanie O'Rourke. Stephanie is with Cone Resnick, and um, we'll bring her up and let her introduce herself, and then we've got a lot of content to go through. Stephanie's been, um, been in the weeds on all of this, so Stephanie, welcome. I'll let you talk a little bit about yourself and, and how you've spent the last year. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lisa, I appreciate um, the ASCPA having me. So I am a partner, a tax partner at Kun Resnick. We actually formed about a year ago an SBA task force, which I co-lead, and that is to go through all these relief programs. So help clients understand and navigate through the various programs, the like you spoke about the interplay with the programs and, and uh, the rules and regulations, all the rules and regulations around them. So um, while it's been the most challenging year of my life um, career-wise, it's probably been the most rewarding as well because we really have helped numerous clients and friends of the firm really understand and get through, you know, get through the other side uh, of the pandemic. I also serve as I, I'm one of the leaders in our hospitality, our hospitality um, industry practice. I am I lead the emerging brand. Um, emerging brand division, as well as the operational and financial consulting. So I'm, I'm advising clients every day and again, navigating through this. And so it was natural that I was going to be because my industry hospitality was so affected that I was going to uh, be leading those efforts. So, and again, I'm leading the efforts on uh, with my team of 50 people um, of the, you know, fortunate to have those 50 people, the restaurant revitalization fund as well. Great. Thank you. So at a high level, we've talked about the Restaurant Revitalization Fund in the past, but I wanted to bring Stephanie in because she's got such great insights from answering the questions her, her clients are already um, throwing at her. So if you look at it, you've got $28.6 billion. It is a grant program. It's direct through the SBA, and it's designed to replace revenue lost during the pandemic. It's not open yet. And Stephanie, I know that you've been talking with the SBA and, and attending some of their town halls. What are you hearing about the rollout? Sure, so about four days ago, they uh, tweeted <laughs> that um, and um, had some articles that they were in the next two weeks, they were coming announcing the pilot program, which is basically they're gonna take PP, it's a seven day program to, I guess, work out some of the kinks and, um, they're trying to learn from lesson, you know, lessons, um, lessons that they they had through PPP. Some of the mistakes that were made in the past, so it's a smoother rollout. So that will be a seven-day pilot program. They haven't announced when that's going to start. And once that seven-day pilot program is over, then all applicants can can apply. So I'm thinking sometime in May is realistic, seeing that it's um, already April 22nd at this point. And there's a prioritization plan for this program, right? So Correct. everyone can apply when the portal opens, but they're going to do some set asides. Yes, they're doing. There's there's many set asides, but um, in in speaking to the SBA and some of the town halls that I've attended, they're encouraging everybody to apply on day one because they want to. 
they want to really go back to the government and say, I know that you gave us $28.6 billion for this program, but we have pending applications for maybe $128.6 uh, billion. So if you could please replenish this fund or start thinking about replenishing this fund for an industry that has been, you know, obviously dramatically affected by, by the pandemic. So they're, um, so they are encouraging, but there, there is, there are some, there are, you know, set asides and, and carve outs, and that's about nine billion dollars. So when you do the math for everybody who is, and, and they're really Main Street, Main Street, you know, the smaller guys and gals that probably will not get through the next three, maybe six, 12 months without, you know, nine, 12 months without um, some additional relief. So it's basically the carve outs are anybody from $1.5 million below um, where they're, they're carving out that money. So it's, a, it's roughly about $9, $9 billion. So again, for the rest of, for anybody over that who had revenues, you know, gross receipts of more than $1.5 billion um, in 2019, they're going to be on that second, you know, that not that second tranche, but again, they're not part of that that carve out. They're not going to get some of that preferential treatment. And then you have the 21 day period where the SBA is going to be reviewing those, whether it's a woman owned business, a, uh, a woman owned, a socially and economically disadvantaged or veteran owned businesses. And I, I do want to point out because I've gotten many phone calls asking me, well, what if we change our ownership today? Um, will that, you know, to, to be part of that priority, everybody wants to be obviously part, part of the uh, priority group. And um, it's important to, they just actually, and we'll talk about the RRF uh, knowledge base, but they just came out saying that basically your ownership as of March 11th, 2021, you, you can't change it. So whatever it was at that point in time, that is going to drive whatever certification you make uh, on the applications. So you mentioned the knowledge base and we got some additional resources this week, a program guide and the sample application and the knowledge base. I know you've had a chance to look at that. Um, if we can go back to the previous slide. Um, so what are your thoughts on the resources that they've put out today? So the 21 page guide, it's a, it's a great starting point. Obviously, just like PPP, there's continuous questions and, and they're, they're evolving. So it's a good starting point. And I will encourage people to go back because they are updating it. They released it on 417 and they had updates on, on 419. So I, I would encourage everybody, and they don't tell you exactly what's been updated, but I would encourage you all to look at it on a regular basis for your clients and encourage your clients to look at it. The knowledge base is very interesting. Um, and the, the 16 page, you know, sample application, that's, you know, it's pretty cut and dry um, for sure. And, and hopefully every, you know, the, the applications mirror and, and when they have their partners, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, that they're, they're going to mirror those applications because people are already doing draft applications. I know my clients are, already, you know, getting prepared and doing those draft applications. The knowledge base, it's interesting. Um, there's some misinformation. I've noted some misinformation. Um, you know, they talk about, they're unsure about the taxability of um of that and we know from the from the actual american rescue act that it, they noted that it would not be deemed taxable it's a tax-free um you know grant and that the expenses will be deductible so that's you know somewhat misinformation and there's also some conflicting information in there when they tell you in in some of the questions it's 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 positioned like an faq and in some of the questions they'll say you can't you know each underlying ein has to um, apply for their own grant. And then in another question, they'll talk about, well, if you got a PPP, if you got a PPP on, in a holding company with the underlying entities that have EINs, their own EINs, well, then you're gonna do it uh, at the holding company level because they're trying to marry that PPP and you know that PPP loan uh, to automatically apply it, automatically populate it into your into your application, into the, the applicant's application. So they're gonna be, it's gonna be a situation where they're gonna marry, marry the two. So you have some conflict there um, in many instances. So almost take it, you know, with a grain, you know, like it, it's useful, it's definitely useful, but I think there's going to be questions, further questions that are gonna spur from that for clarification. And um, and they are adding to it, adding to it every day. So, so look at, apply for the alerts, 
I have an email for the alerts um, from the SBA as practitioners. I think everybody, if you're if you're involved in this, you should definitely be aware of everything that's coming out in a timely basis, so you could communicate it to your clients, uh, your client base for sure. But um, I think there'll be uh, again. I think there's going to be a lot of uh, clarification that comes through. I'm not sure. You know, I, I know they're trying to get as much information out as possible, but again, it's not all accurate. Yeah, yeah, great, great point. So on the next slide, we list out some of the eligible entities and ineligible entities. Um, we got some some information this week. Nonprofits are not included, and um, permanently closed operations are not included. There are some other details um, about ineligibility. There's a great chart in that guide that we gave you a link to on the previous page. But what kinds of questions are you getting? What's your most common question? Stephanie, on, on actually, yeah, sure. Coming from hotels, so to hotels who have restaurant operations, um, and they're they're housed in one EIN, and so um, they're not bifurcated at all, and they don't they're not separate and distinct, and the, they are not. And, and the SBA has come out and, and basically said, unless it's a it's a, it has its own EIN, it's a separate, distinct um, legal entity, then you cannot participate. But interestingly enough, in are allowed to participate. Now, there, there are certain limitations around um, or thresholds that have to be met if you're an in on the 33% 30, of gross receipts um, test, but it's they're, they're being shut out. And then they use an example going back to, going back to the um, knowledge based, which is interesting. They use an example if that you have a dry cleaner and a restaurant in the same EIN. <laughs> Why you'd have that, I don't know. But if you did, then you could strip out the restaurant. You could strip out the restaurant gross receipts. So again, a lot of inconsistency. So that that's that's really um, a big a big question. And also the permanently closed. So you have a lot of entities that they might have handed over the keys. A lot of locations they handed over the keys to the landlords, but they haven't legally closed the entity. So in their minds, they're saying, well, maybe I could find another space. Um, maybe I could do something a little bit differently. Um, there, I'm sure there's going to be additional clarity on that. I think the intent is for people who have really moved, you know, if they, if you, if you really closed, you shouldn't be participating. You shouldn't be participating in this program. So I think, again, there's a lot more questions that are going to need to be answered and clarifications. And, and you, you know, you're making certain certifications. Your clients are making certain certifications and um, they need to understand the ramifications of making a certification that may not be true. So on that point about permanently closed, we know so many restaurants were closed temporarily. Um, so they may have been shut down for three months. Now they're reopening at uh, partial capacity. That doesn't mean they're permanently closed. Just because Correct. they were closed for a few months doesn't mean they're permanently closed. Yes, that's fine. Yeah. They, yeah, it's, it's really permanently. Think about it is if, you're, if your client is a restaurant operator, they basically hand it over the keys to the landlord and, yeah. and shut down. That, okay. that's, that's where we're at. And a quick point on gross receipts. It's not um, some of those uh, different entity types have uh, a threshold of 33% of their um, sales have to be on site. And that's not as intimidating as it sounds. When I first read it, I thought, sounds like a pretty tough barrier for a bakery, but if you read the definition, it's more generous than that. So just, um, just take note of that. Right. I, All right. I, will, I will just, can I, can I just on the, on the, just the something to note, that's a question that's come out and the, actually the SBA has addressed it. Um, for restaurant, for your clients that are restaurant, offer, restaurant operators that have pivoted, done a good job and done a lot of third party delivery. And they were able to, um, they've asked a ton of my clients have asked me, well, it's, you know, it's not the same type of revenue, right? Because we have to pay these large delivery fees. So can we reduce in 2020, can we reduce our deliver our revenue by the delivery fees? The SBA has addressed it. And the answer is no to that. So okay. every, so you, you should inform your clients. And obviously if you bring them to the knowledge, they'll, they'll see that. So next up we've got, how do you apply for the grant? And, and there are three ways under this program that the SBA is offering. Um, the portal is pretty straightforward. There's a telephone option. If you've got um, you know, a small business who may not have access to internet, um, they can actually call in and then follow up in the mail. But I wanna focus on this one about the, the point of sale partners. And um, Stephanie mentioned signing up for the alerts from the SBA. One came out just before we got on the call. 
about um, the SBA announcing this point of sale partner initiative. So Stephanie, you've done some looking into this. What do you think about it? So there's a couple of things that um, the practitioner's client should be aware of. First of all, every single partnership doesn't mean that, you know, some they're serving different purposes. So some probably like a square who did the PPP loans and, and has those capabilities is probably they're in the, the SBA trans system already. Um, they might be doing full on applications, but then you have other point of sales companies that are only doing sort of like application packages where they're getting the sales, right? So they're getting the revenue portion for, for to, in order to submit. So they're not all partnerships, let's just say, are not created equally and it don't make the assumption, your client should make the assumption that you could, def, you could go through one of these POS companies. Also, something to consider that you as practitioners should really communicate to your clients is that not all sales may be in the point of sales for that company. So if they have third party delivery or, or maybe e-commerce or they have um, catering, they not all third party delivery. I have clients that don't put everything through the POS. So there's definitely going to be a lack of information, right? It's not going to be a complete package. So everybody needs to be aware of that, that you're, you, you know, the, the expectation is obviously if you are a, if you are, you know, a calendar year, cause we'll, we'll talk about if you're not a calendar year, but when you're looking at your 2019 tax return, they're going to tick and tie. And the expectation is if they see a million dollars of revenue coming from your POS, that that's going to match your tax return. So that's, and potentially maybe not all, you know, the comps are running through resales and returns and allowances and things, because if you have third party comps that are coming through third party um, returns and things of that, you know, chargebacks that are coming through, they might not hit the POS system. So that's something to, that everybody really needs to be cognizant of. And that's a great tie into our next topic, which is revenue um, and, and, the, and the award calculations. Um, we'll speed it up just a little bit. So you've got the details here. They'll be in your slides. Um, you've got three calculations depending on when the um, hospitality operation began its operations. And Stephanie, we had a conversation around how fiscal year filers are going to um, treat this, some of these calculations. So what are your thoughts right. on that? So for fiscal year filers, because they're, they're going back to, you know, your tax return, but it, everything talks about the calendar year 2020 and, you know, 2019, um, there, it's going to be a challenge. I know that it's been discussed with the SBA and, and they're talking through it. Um, you know, the, the, the whole calculation, because you have many options based upon your situation, and even if you were housed in one EIN and you have certain restaurants that might have opened in 2019 or didn't open until 2020 and some that opened or full year 2019, and you could potentially use all three cal computations, calculations in one application. So I'd like to believe they're going to be nimble enough where they're giving them the opportunity to present their tax returns, but also give a reconciliation of what their calendar year looks like because of how they're truly going to be affected by the pandemic. So we're hoping that, again, that um, they address that and they're not going to have an issue filing those, you know, when they, and when they put in their 4506Ts and they try to reconcile that there'll be an offline calculation. Okay, great. Thank you. And um, then we've got what's included in revenue on the next slide, I believe, and we've talked about what's in and what's out. You talked about delivery fees. Um, just really quickly, this is detailed out on the program guide, so we will keep driving along, but look at that do not include. So I think there's some good news there for some yeah, there's, of hours. Yeah, there's absolutely good news on there. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it sort of mirrors, except for the PPP is in there. Um, a lot of what the PPP mirrored, and, and I think what's really important are these state and local small business grants that are not included or not to be deemed included, which yeah. you just mentioned before, interesting enough on, on the PPP side, that they are included, but they're not included here. So I think that's, that's a win. We'll, we'll get back to that complexity slide again. So um, moving along, we've got our look at eligible expenses. You've got a broad range of eligible expenses and a broad time frame. And so I'm gonna skip on over to the next slide because that ties in perfectly to some of the conversations Stephanie was telling me about with her clients about um, how to navigate all of the interplay of these items because RRF gives you broader categories and longer time frame. 
Sure. So you have the uh, PPP versus you know RF. If if you haven't done if you haven't done an application yet, um, for some people that are really late in the game, um, you really need to consider whether you're going to withdraw that application to get RRF. Now, our, obviously, RRF is not guaranteed. It's a it's a finite um, set of money in there, and we don't know if they're going to replenish it. So there's there's that. There's also the interplay between all the programs. If you already have done PPP, if you're lucky, if your clients are lucky enough to get the RRF, and if they're exploring ERC, so there's an interplay. It's you know the strategy between all three programs and getting let's just call it the best bang for its buck, right? Getting you know being able to get full forgiveness optimize on ERC and then being able to, to utilize that. So, you know, I'm going to dovetail on how CPAs can help, right? They're going to, they're going to be able to help on the application process, right? Understanding when it's not so cut and dry, 2020 as 2019, um, knowing what to include, what not to include, you know, giving that, that last final approval. Um, but for the companies that have not opened all of 2019 and they're using calculation three, that gets a little bit more complex and making sure that they're including the right expenses eligible because it's eligible expenses. So making sure they're including that also, you know, on owner's pay, we didn't really talk about that, but that's something that's, you know, that has been addressed. And it's interesting on S corps that the salary, they're thinking about including the salary, but on guaranteed payments or not, are not included as an eligible payroll cost, which absolutely makes no sense because it's just the, the, the way partnerships work as compared to, um, you know, S corps. Um, so, you know, it's really how can, you know, CPAs help? It's, you know, through the PPP, it was the forgiveness process and obviously the application process. But, you know, it's it's really that interplay. Um, there's also going to be a reporting requirement. And so some of your smaller clients will probably need a lot more handholding with that. And so I think it's important that um, you, that they they learn to, you know, to learn the rules, you know, people that are involved in this program really understand the rules and help their clients, you know, navigate through that. And lastly, on, um, you know, affiliation rules, uh, they are very, they are way too good to be true as they stand today, um, because it looks like certain based upon your ownership structure that you're going to be able some operators are going to be able to get a lot more money than others. Um, because the way that the rules are written and they're they're in the language, they're all over the place. They're they're consistent, but it just doesn't seem to align with the spirit of what they're trying to do, the spirit of the program. So it'll be interesting to see if they come out with additional guidance on the affiliation rules. So we'll keep you all posted yeah. on our on our next town halls if if we get any changes there. Yeah. Well, Stephanie, that was fantastic, and um, we will. I mean, this is this is kind of week one of RRF. We're going to be going. Um, we'll be talking about RRF, obviously, in the month of May. So more to come there, and lots of good questions, lots of good feedback. But we we got a quick lightning round here because we do have some questions come in, but we'll make this quick here. Well, I'll hit the first one. There's lots of questions about lenders pushing on forgiveness, either saying they won't do it. Or saying they want to wait, or the clients have to do it. You know, the, your clients have rights. There's there, there's this program here. The lenders, they all have their policies. The lenders, some lenders right now are focusing on applications, and they're not doing forgiveness. So that's that's their choice. And others want to get the forgiveness done. So I, I think this is something that uh, you you should understand. But you know, your clients shouldn't be pushed into forgiveness per se. Barry, let me just throw throw a question to you here. Uh, related to, you know, what what's happening with the tax deadline. You've heard this many, many years. People saying, you know, thoughts of a permanent move of the tax deadline. And, and this is a lightning round. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I think it's pretty clear that the government and the IRS doesn't support any kind of permanent movement on that because uh, they didn't want to move from April to May and didn't even want to do it comprehensively. So that's a long shot. Well, I think, we'll, Barry, we'll give you some closing remarks here. What Lisa and I will just do real quickly is run through the resources. You've got the, you can bring them back up. You've got the town hall slides here. I mean, the town hall archives, which are uh, all, all available at AICPA TV. You've got the great uh, SBA Resource Center. Uh, Lisa highlighted today some, some new materials on it. Twice a week, we're running this business funding portal, deep dive into what's going on with our platform and the error codes. I know some questions came in today. One of the questions is, is about that eight week, uh, you know, waiting that eight week covered period to do the second draw. We're going to talk to the SBA about it. If we can get those in, we'll get those in. There's this confusion there with the lenders. So just something we're trying to trying to work through. ERC, this is going to be something we're going to continue to talk about as, as, the, as the year uh, moves forward. 
and a new PPP uh, chart. So we, we leverage social media to, to stay informed. And Barry, sometimes it is. We've got so much information. Your, your opening section, your outlook was, was very well received as, as Lisa and Stephanie's section was. I'll give you kind of the, the, the closeout uh, for, for this week's town hall. Well, I mean, first off, we know it's complicated and it's tiresome and all of those things, and it's 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 real. And so, a go back to my take care of yourself and be aware there. I, I would just say, again, in this trusted advisor notion, the interworking of all of these things and what opportunities are there for your clients. I know it's complicated. I know it's hard to predict because of those issues, but it is probably what your client or your employer is counting on you to do. And I think that that's something to to put some attention on. Thank you. See you. See you on May 6, 3 p.m. Thanks. Thank you for your participation. You can now subscribe to the AICPA Town Hall series on your favorite podcast platform, as well as watch archives on YouTube and AICPA TV. Tune in for live broadcasts Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time.